everybody to our first online pop culture science panel, a partnership between the Comic-Con Museum and the Fleet Science Center, both located in Balboa Park. We were sad that we couldn't host the first live event as we had planned on March 13th, but fear not, we will repeat this. It will be coming on some Friday the 13th. We will get scared with the movie Get Out and a little bit of a science talk um, about the science of horror movies. But today, at least we can start with a little uh, web panel on something nerdy and fun, which is forensic science. Uh, something that we, a lot of us watch on TV. So I'm excited that I have two local speakers with me tonight who are experts in forensic science and they're gonna introduce themselves right now. Roxanne, why don't you take it away? Hi everyone. Um, I'm a forensic scientist. Right now, I work in an area called digital forensics, which means that I get cell phones from crime scenes and I get to look at everybody's personal information on their cell phone, um, which is really interesting, a little scary sometimes. There's a lot of stuff saved on there. Um, but before that, I worked in the DNA unit doing DNA analysis from crime scene samples um, because my background is a lot of science. I got my a bachelor's degree in physiology and neuroscience because I really like brains and then I went on to get my master's in cell and molecular biology so I really like what I do it's a lot of fun and excited to talk with you guys today. <laughs> Thanks Roxanne. Tony Ann how about you? Well I'm Tony Ann Rebic and I've been in forensics for 16 years now. I started out just processing crime scenes getting a go out with the officers and take photographs and DNA swabs, fingerprints, things like that. And for the past 10 years now, I've been working specifically in firearms. So I, any gun crime that comes in, I get to deal with that. I, I love it, it's fun, it's interesting. I have to deal with everything from historical guns all the way through modern guns. I can take bullets from a crime scene, put them on a microscope and tell you if it was fired from a particular gun. I also do crime scene reconstruction, which is really my love. Uh, I get to go to crime scenes and look around and say where the shooter was standing and look at blood and be able to tell you different things about what happened at the crime scene based on science, which is which is very interesting and fun for me. I, I enjoy getting to solve problems and puzzles like that. My background, I have a bachelor's of science in microbiology, a bachelor's of science in crime law and justice, and my master's in forensic science. Wow, man. Oh, I already have so many questions. I don't even know where to start. Um, <laughs> okay, I have to start with one of the shows that I wasn't quite able to finish watching because I'm, I'm a scary cat. I get scared super easy. But my husband loved it, which was Dexter. And I remember <laughs> him telling me about Dexter and like the blood splatter and how he would reconstruct sides, crime scenes and sides because of blood splatter and things like that. <laughs> Tony Ann, did they get it right in the show? Did you watch it first of all? Have you seen Dexter? I've seen, I've seen some episodes. I haven't okay. seen the whole thing either. Uh, trying to, it's been a while, so I'm not sure so much about the specifics of it, but, but they're right. That is something that we can do. It's kind of crazy when you, uh, it, it, I, you go to these scenes and you look at the blood and at first, it's always overwhelming. You get there and you're like, oh my goodness. And then you start breaking down. You're like, oh, I recognize this pattern. And you start going through. The funniest thing I think for blood spatter is actually the way we get trained. So we go to these classes where we take pig's blood. Now that we, we purchase it, we don't go slaughtering pigs. Thank we you. Pig's blood. And we'll, we actually try to recreate how this blood happens. So you take a knife and you dip it in blood and you it around and you see that it actually makes a very specific pattern, a linear pattern that goes and you can start measuring the drops and figuring out exactly where they came from. You take a sponge soaked in blood and you smack it with a hammer and it bursts out into this kind of starburst looking pattern. And again, you can look at the drops and you can actually using a whole bunch of trig calculate out where that impact happened. So it's really kind of cool nerdy science stuff when you're sitting there doing all this trig and calculations but in the end it's so cool because you can figure out where it came from um it, it's it's interesting so yes dexter does uh 
did have a lot of blood spatter stuff. That was his expertise. We do not murder people to figure out how we do, how to do this. And we don't, and neither do we, we don't take care of the pigs either. We, we just use nice little buckets of blood. That's how we learn. But, um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of truth to the fact that we can do that with blood. I'm glad that you're not taking the whole um, justice into your own hands like no, Dexter no, did no, no. <laughs> Good to hear that. <laughs> I think I'd be a little, I, I'm not squeamish with crime scenes, but I, I'm, not, I'm not going that far. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> it was a very brilliant show, though, from, from what I, I heard. Um, and maybe I'll be brave enough one time to watch it, but I get really, really squeamish, so I have to, <laughs> to be careful. <laughs> But talking about blood, Roxanne, you said you did some DNA analysis, um, and that comes up in a lot of crime shows, you know, from CSI to NCIS to, I don't know, I think every cop show has that component in it. Um, so when you watch those shows, do you think they do a good job? And what does it actually entail to do a DNA analysis? <laughs> they... They speed up the process a lot. <laughs> okay. Even when it's, uh, you know, a, the, the most important case that the department has and they want me to rush, rush, rush and get it done. Sometimes you put it on an instrument and the instrument always takes two and a half hours to run. I can't make it go faster. You know, and that's just one little step in the entire process. So even if I was sitting at each instrument and grabbing it off as quickly as I could and throwing it on the next one, would still take at least a half a day but that e even at that it's not super realistic it would probably take me a little bit longer to uh just get through the analysis right so yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the major things it takes some time um one of the other interesting things is they always seem to actually get a dna profile um sometimes a person will swab something and you won't get any dna off of it and then it just kind of ends right there. It's like, well, I, I tried. There wasn't DNA. Maybe somebody goes to a crime scene and they think they see blood, but maybe it was just nail polish. Maybe it was some paint. Maybe it was some dirt or rust. Like, I, you know, they grab it and they tell me, oh, I got this great blood swab. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And you run it through and there's absolutely no DNA on it. So then you say, well, maybe it wasn't actually blood that you swabbed at the crime scene. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we sometimes always don't get results. Um, and then one of the, the other biggest things um, is if you do end up getting a profile, if you do end up making a comparison, because it's a comparative science, you have to have a reference. Um, a reference sample would be something where, say, they would come to me, they would swab the inside of my mouth, and then my name would be associated with that DNA profile they could compare my profile to all the evidence to see if, I, if I'm included. Uh, when we go to court, it's, uh, it's statistically driven. So it's not like when I do a comparison to my known person, I don't say, oh, that's, that's their DNA, or no, it's not. I provide you a statistic to say it's this many times more likely that it's this individual's DNA. So I think sometimes jurors don't realize when they come to a criminal trial, they're going to have to listen to a lot of math and a lot of statistics. I'm, I'm not the one that goes up there and say, yes, it's his DNA. Yes, he committed the crime, right? Because even if your DNA is there, does it mean that you actually committed the crime? It just places you approximately at a location. It doesn't say when you were there. It doesn't say why you were there. So it's really up to the prosecutor and the detective to pull all these things together, um, which I don't do, which I can't do with DNA analysis. But in the TV shows, they at least say it was this person for sure, like 100% he was there. You know, whether that person did it or not might still be part of the, the plot of the show to figure it out, but they, they say it was such certainty. So that's not how it is in real life. Oh no, I probably sound like I'm so uncertain on the stand, even though I, I'm, I'm confident in my testing, but I, I won't say that it is a person on that stand. I'll provide a statistic and I'll tell you that it's a really, really big statistic. You know, maybe there's, it's a number with like 40 zeros after it, you know, some insane number, right? So a million only has six zeros. So my numbers are a lot bigger that I deal with, but I won't tell you that it's him. <laughs> 
That is interesting. So that's where, Tony Ann, where you come in then, right? Because you're reconstructing a, a crime scene. So let's say Roxanne says, I'm, I don't know how ever many zeros certain that it was this person. How, what do you do then to link that person to the crime? Like what are, walk us through some of the steps. Well, like Roxanne said, that's actually more the detective thing. So the reconstruction part is taking little parts of the scene and figuring out certain aspects of what happened. But we still, it's science. We can't tell a story. We can't say motivation. We can't say anything like that. What we're doing is essentially, I tell people it's like um, the difference of looking at Facebook photos of a party versus being there. Because you look at the photos and you go, oh, at this point that this picture was taken, you know, this guy had his arm around this girl and they were talking. Well, okay, maybe you're like, oh, what's going on? But you can't actually say what happened. Maybe she hated him and that was the one second he had his arm around her before she smacked him. Or maybe that was like the beginning of a great love connection. You have no idea. But you know that at that instant that that picture was taken, that's what happened. So the reconstruction is, hey, here's a shooting trajectory. That means that the shooter was standing right here at that second that, you know, that, that target was hit, whether it was a wall or a person or something, that, that's where they were standing. Okay, were they running away from them, you know, acting in self-defense, or were they running towards them? I don't know. I just know that that's where they were standing. Same with the blood. You know, an impact happened, you know, someone got hit right here in this location. Was it a struggle? Was it self-defense? There are certain things that we can piece together that indicate one thing or another, just like Roxanne can turn around and say, this is most likely this person's blood and this was most likely this person's spit or whatever. But it's all little tiny pieces and the more pieces you get, the more comprehensive of a story you can put together, but it's not up to us to tell the story. It's up to the detectives to start asking questions and finding out, well, what did you see? What was this person's motivation? And that it, it's really, the TV shows make it like one or two people solve the whole thing and figure it all out. But it's really all these teeny tiny little pieces of, it was this person's blood in this location using this gun. And you know, this person heard this person say that, and, and you just start piecing it together and it ends up forming what we hope is a true and accurate story for the, to present in court. Interesting. Fascinating. I have more questions. <laughs> but I want to um, give it back to Roxanne for a second. Um, so you said part of your work is the cell phone and technology part, right? So you can look at people's phone, which probably is part of the puzzle, Tony Ann, right? To see where the people were, what they did, who they texted and stuff like that. So what exactly are you looking at? How much access do you have to my phone? <laughs> if I committed a crime. <laughs> Ooh, so the phones are actually really helpful, I think, in crime scenes, especially when a suspect decides to take a picture or a video. Then it's like we were there. Um, so those are really fun. <laughs> but, you know, each one's a little, it's a little different because it's going to depend on what um, unit the detective comes from. A lot of them want to look at pictures or videos, maybe emails or chats. Um, some kind of text messages that maybe they're sending to their friends or even their call logs or their contacts. Are they associated with other certain people um, that they claim that they're not or something like that? So uh, the way that we can get into phones is, is pretty fun. We sometimes don't need your password. And then depending on your type of phone, I may get a lot of information or I may get a little. So some are pretty good. Um, it's a cool process between the phone companies and the software programs I use. A phone company will upgrade their phone, so you always want to update, right? Um, so update your phone, it'll like maybe add some encryption to it, add some extra security, and then these companies that I work with will say, okay, they added this new wall, how do we break in now? And then they will update their software, and it's just a constant war between the two trying to make the phones more secure and then giving me the capabilities to get into the phones. That is awesome. Also a little scary. I mean, I don't plan any crimes or whatever, but you know, <laughs> it's still, it's a little worrisome. <laughs> no password required, huh? To get into my phone. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> so 
Tony, when I look at some of the TV shows, you mentioned that it takes a lot of people, right? But sometimes they just, they, you see maybe like two or three crime scene technician in the background, you know, they have a, the white suit, some, some <laughs> blue booty thingies over the shoes and, and gloves and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And then you have the detectives waltzing in with like no protection on their shoes. Um, yeah. And they just, it looks like the technicians have been there for two hours, but then the detective goes in and he sees something in that one second he's in the room or she's in the room and then they solve the crime. How likely is that in real life? And how many people go to a crime scene? Like what is the process? Who's allowed in there? How long does it take to work through a crime um, scene? Crime scenes, it really depends on what we're doing and what we're looking for. They could be as short as a few hours, but they could be as long as, several days oh, wow. it really just depends on what's going on what they're looking for what they're collecting uh, typically we have uh detectives with us pretty much the extent of the crime scene partially for a few different reasons partially for security um, if you're standing there looking through a camera or focusing on blood pattern you don't have your eyes all around making sure that um suspects aren't returning that angry people aren't you know or even just not necessarily angry, overly emotional people aren't barging into your scene. So they're there for that. They're also there to communicate information. So as scientists, we try to stay somewhat, um, we try very hard to stay unbiased and just kind of <clears throat> take the scene for what it is, take the evidence for what it is, because we don't want to form any opinions ahead of time. We don't want to go in there thinking, oh, well, this guy was standing here and he shot this person and it, it kind of clouds our judgment. We want to just go in and say, this is what the evidence tells me. But at the same time, it's a huge investigation. So while we're doing a crime scene, there's detectives out interviewing people, there's detectives canvassing the area, there's detectives getting video surveillance. And so everything needs to link together. So I might say, find a red t-shirt laying in the corner. Okay, that doesn't mean anything to me, except it's a red t-shirt. But maybe there was a detective that was watching surveillance video and they saw a suspect wearing a red t-shirt. So now that becomes important. So we have detectives at the scene that may look and go, oh, you found a red t-shirt. Oh, he's looking for a guy with a red t-shirt. This brings that together. So we do need that connection. That's why we need teamwork because we want to go through this. The science part, the lab part does take a very long time, but that initial getting to the scene, we want to preserve everything as soon after it happened as possible, just like we want to go get video surveillance and talk to witnesses and that whole thing, you want that initial, when a crime first happens, that initial push for information, you get a whole bunch of people involved, but then you also need the people who coordinate all the different little tiny pieces that you're finding. Yeah, so how many people um, are normally on a crime scene? Totally depends on the kind of scene. Um, on the crime scene, typically you have one person doing the collection, then you might have a reconstruction person like me, at least one scene detective, usually there's two or three around doing stuff. And then officers kind of covering the perimeter is more likely. Sometimes you end up with trainees. If it's a big scene, they might break it up and some people are working on this part, some people are working on that part. It, it really depends on the scope of the crime, what we're looking for. If it's a very sensitive DNA case, we're not going to have a whole lot of people in. If it's something big, um, God forbid you get like a World Trade Center type thing, you have thousands of people in there trying to pull apart the building. So it, it very much uh, depends on what's, what it is. Well, that kind of makes sense. In the TV shows, they always make it um, sound like every crime, whatever it is, gets the same attention. And I wonder if that's the the case in, in real life. Like if somebody broke into my house and stole my computer and my TV, what kind of crime scene analysis can I expect? Are there going to be 20 people trampling into my house to look at things? You know, it's, we like to make everybody feel that their crime is equally a concern for us because it is traumatic. If you had somebody break into your house, that is extremely traumatic to you as a victim. So we don't want to be like, oh, I just came from a murder. You're not important. We don't want to do that to people. And sometimes I used to be in more patrol Role, and that was difficult. You know, I'd come from like this horrific child abuse to this lady who's freaking out because, you know, someone broke her window. And it's like, really? Really? This is the worst thing that's ever happened? I just saw this horrible thing. 
but as a professional, you've got to know, oh, of course, I'm very concerned for you. Let me take care of this. But the reality is, yes, there are only so many resources. And so clearly a homicide um, uh, or other very severe crimes are going to get a lot more attention than others. And sometimes things that are very big crimes don't necessarily need as many people because it's very straightforward versus something that might be a little bit smaller, but it's a bigger mystery. So maybe we do have more. It, it definitely varies. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. You know, I want all the forces on the big cases <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Roxanne, a little bit about yourself. So you have a background in uh, microbiology and from, we had talks before, from knowing your background, I have the feeling that forensic science wasn't necessarily what you had in mind when you went to school. Is that right? Never even crossed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up in this field? I took a very odd way to get here. Um, so after I got my master's degree, I actually got that because I wanted to teach at community colleges. So I was teaching at a couple locations around San Diego, um, primarily human anatomy and physiology, which are my favorite subjects. And one of the instructors that I worked with, um, he worked there part-time, taught a night class, and he worked full-time um, working with the haz or hazardous waste department with the city. And I just had this vision of myself in a giant suit going through the sewers of San Diego and I thought to myself this is the dream job. <laughs> it sounds like I could crawl through caves all day and get paid for it and maybe see what people flush down their toilets. I don't know. So I thought that it was amazing. So I saw that there was an opening and I applied. They never called me unfortunately. Aww. What was seven years later I'm still waiting. Um, <laughs> so if you're listening I'm still available but <laughs> But while I was applying with the city of San Diego, the job posting right underneath it was for a DNA analyst. And when I looked at the qualifications, I met all the qualifications. I had no forensic background. All I knew was my little bit of stuff that I watched from CSI, but I'd worked in a lab. So I knew how to extract DNA and how to run it on some of these instruments. Um, I just hadn't applied it in this type of setting. And so when I went to interview, they were like, wow, you have a good, strong science background. And they thought it would be pretty easy to teach me the little bit of forensics that I needed to fully get me understanding what was going on. And been there ever since. That's so, awesome. So crawling through sewers in a hazmat <laughs> suit is a dream? I thought it would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly you still think so. <laughs> That's, Maybe you that's, have to try in a sewer and you can you know, <laughs> solve that <exactly>. dream. <laughs> Tony, and your background suggests that you had already in mind that you wanted to do something yeah. with criminal justice. Um, where did that passion come from and why did you pursue that as a career? I, I, went, I was the total opposite of Roxanne. I decided at six years old because I was going to be a forensic scientist. Uh, my my grandfather was a police officer, and I wanted to be just like my grandpa. And he, he was a police officer, but he had had um, he had been shot in the line of duty. He had had a, a lot of um, he worked in a very rough neighborhood in Jersey City, and so he really didn't want to see his little granddaughter follow in his footsteps. So. But I loved, I loved solving puzzles. I wanted to go and solve crime. Like, I have six. I don't even know where this came into. I think I read too much Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys and stuff. And Sherlock Holmes and all of that. Like, yeah. I just wanted to be like them. And so he directed me towards, well, you like science? What about a forensic scientist? So now this was in the early 80s. People did not know about forensic science at this point. So I was the weird little kid. Everybody would go around the classroom, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a firefighter, a police officer. I wanted to be a forensic scientist. Nobody knew what that was. So I tried to do And inevitably, that would result in my parents getting a phone call from my first, second, third grade teacher going, we're a little worried about Tony Ann. Do you know she wants to look at dead bodies when she grows up? And 
like, don't worry, it's fine, we're all good. And so I was very excited when CSI came out. I was kind of, um, it was right around end of high school, beginning of college years, and suddenly I was like, oh, that's what you want to do. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not that, I mean, I'm weird because I do want to go to crime scenes, but I'm not that weird. Like, it's a really cool thing, and I, people finally understood me. So I was very, excited. I was very lucky, but I, I was definitely the odd one as a kid. I, I wanted to do this my whole life. I was very excited to go around with my stamp pad trying to take people's fingerprints. It's very, that is awesome. Really <laughs> I also love that pop culture helped explain the people around you what you actually yeah. wanted to do, right? <laughs> See, as yeah, I came to the really rescue. <laughs> yeah, he really truly did not understand until that started coming out. And that, I think, for me, is the one thing I was grateful for. So now I say I'm a forensic scientist, and I'm just like, oh, that's so cool. Tell me about it. But before it was like, wait, what? What do you want to do? <laughs> and I was kind of proud of this weird. I'm like, yeah, it's still gross and weird, and I get that, but it's. It's cool, and people finally understand that. I think why I think it's so cool. That is awesome. So, talking about TV shows, do you have a favorite crime scene show, and if so, why do you like it? Hmm, <laughs> it's a good question, right? Sorry, I didn't prep you for that. <laughs> I'm just throwing hmm. things at you. <laughs> huh. I did like. Um... Initially, I really liked Bones because I liked the anatomy. I liked the anthropology. Their lab setup is absolutely terrible to keep a giant thing of evidence in the middle of an open space like that. But besides that, it's super cool. I love the little um, computer, what was it called? The Angelatron, like mm -hmm. actually a thing. Our jobs would be so easy <laughs> to do some of that. And so I liked how they kind of like made these little things that would actually be kind of cool if they really did exist. <laughs> so I like that one. That's but perfect. So you think a, a setup in the middle of a room like that is not good for crime scene analysis? Why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you, a lot, there's a lot in that show that I don't, that aren't, that is not even close to being correct. But to keep your evidence in a giant open space, um, I mean, I don't recall if there was any ventilation, but honestly, when they got some of those putrid bodies, like I would want to vacuum right there <laughs> over it because that smell is not going away, <laughs> right? So, but to have it open like that, um, I mean, it's, it just increases your potential chance of contamination, especially with DNA aspects of it. So you normally want to keep things um, nice and enclosed. You might want to look at it under a hood even um, if you're concerned either about like the smells or if it's um, we have another unit in our lab the chemistry unit that deals with a lot of drugs so if it's a case where there might be something on the item you'll want to put it in the fume hood so that way it doesn't go up into your face while you're working with it um, and just having the sheer number of people going over to an item of evidence is like really <laughs> stressing me out a lot <laughs> You're like, don't, you're contaminating yes. it. Norm so normally, we kind of alluded to this with like the crime scene stuff, but normally um, when I'm assigned a case, I have no idea if Tony Ann's working the same case, if she has a different item of evidence in the case. We're kept very um, solitary and I'm focused on my one item of evidence and I'm working multiple cases at a time too. I'm not just looking at one case. Our whole lab doesn't, you know, shut down and work the one case together as a team. Um, we're too busy for that. So we have lots of cases going and it's kind of done on purpose. We had kind of alluded to bias, but to not cloud my judgment. So maybe if I were doing DNA on a case and I got an association with the suspect on, on say the red shirt at the crime scene, I don't want Tony Ann to hear that and say, oh, well the gun that was found on the suspect definitely was used in the crime scene too, um, unless it actually was based on our scientific, you know, analysis of it. So, um, you know, like the bone show, everybody's working together, everybody's talking about stuff and we really don't do that. We have our, our reports, the detective collects all of their, our reports, and then it's up to them to put the story together. Um, so they're kind of the keeper of all the information. Um, the scientists are, we tell them what we scientifically find and um, hopefully it helps. Maybe it doesn't. And most of the time I don't know what happens <laughs> unless I'm called to court. You know, like if, if I provide him a report and it doesn't end up helping the case, he doesn't call me up and say, oh, well, thanks for helping. Like this didn't do anything. It just is another report that I wrote and 
I'll never know what happened. Oh, that's kind of sad though. <laughs> I think one of the funny things that people don't always realize, it, it depends on what you need to work it on because sometimes you need to know a little bit more about the case than others. But a lot of times I get evidence and to me, a gun is a gun, a bullet's a bullet. And people come in and go, oh, well, you know, do you have that such and such homicide case or do you have that? And I'm like, oh, I have no idea. I have to go look at my report to even see is this a homicide or is this a drive-by shooting? I don't know. I, I, unless I'm, I mean, it's different when I'm doing the reconstruction and the crime scene, but for the actual lab evidence, we have the information, but that's not our priority. So sometimes it's kind of funny because the detectives will come in, they'll start talking about so-and-so victim or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't know. Let me see. Do I have that? Because I don't worry about that stuff. I, what I care about is, you know, what gun do I have? Does it work? What bullets do I have? To, I, I, I'm, I'm just... And it almost sounds callous to say that I don't care, but it, because I do, I care about, that's, we all get into this profession because we care about stuff, but that's not, that's not my priority. So I don't, I only really look to see you know, what's the victim's name, what's the suspect's name when I'm writing my final report. Otherwise it's like, what kind of gun do I have? What type of thing? It's, and it's partially to prevent bias and partially just because it's, most of what we're doing is dealing with homicides. They're all homicides and gang shootings and, or, you know, depending on, again, depending on your unit, what you're working, yeah. but it, it's someone come up and go, how is that homicide coming? Which one? I got four of them on my desk. It's, yeah. Well, I could see that that helps if you just concentrate on the science side of it without getting the emotional part in that you mentioned both, right? To kind of, yeah, to be as unbiased as you can, I guess, and yeah. let the science speak for itself, which I like. You know, yeah. as a science center, I like the let the science speak for itself. That's pretty perfect. <laughs> so, Tony Ann, did you have a chance to think about what your favorite crime show or detective show might be? It's tough. I've gone through a few different ones. I know I've watched a lot of Law and Order. Um, I think I still will always have a special place in my heart for CSI because that was the one that everybody finally understood. I actually don't watch a whole lot of crime shows anymore. One, because it's so much a part of my real life. And two, because if my husband's sitting there, then I drive him insane. I sit there and have to have a running commentary the whole time. They don't do that. That's not what that pattern, blood pattern says. Why are they, that would never come back that fast. You can't tell that kind of, and I can't keep my mouth shut. I just, I try and I try to just have that conversation in my head, but it comes out and then I annoy him. So we try to pick other shows that aren't, I, I, I can keep the running commentary down a little bit. That makes sense. I think we should do a pop culture science life event when it's safe to do so again and sh show one of those shows and have you do the running commentary or both of you do the running commentary. I think that would be hilarious. I would love if I was actually able to do that and people appreciate it instead of just wanting to smack me. So it'd be kind of fun. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we would have an audience that might appreciate the running commentary <laughs> on this well, show. My mom watches TV shows, and then she calls me up and goes, I saw this show, and this is what happened. Is that real? And I, it's really fun, but then I, got, I a lot of times I haven't seen the show, so I got to ask her four million questions. Yeah. So it would be really yeah. fun to see that. <laughs> and I mean, that's, that's part of shows, right? You're supposed to... to it's about the story. It's not necessarily about the scientific details. They want to get a story across and it's, I love when they pay attention to the science and they get it as right as they can. But yeah, to suspend your disbelief, I think it's perfect. You just have to let it go sometimes and just enjoy it for, for what it is, a TV show that is there to entertain and bring some emotions to life and show some, some real life cases. <laughs> yeah. So the, the one thing that I loved about Bones a lot is that is the not the not necessarily the crime scene recreation, but it's the setting up of an experiment to oh. figure out what happened, right? I mean, <laughs> the King of the Lab set up so many fantastic experiments. Is that how you guys do it when you recreate some stuff? We we can. Um, a lot of the training is kind of is done with. Um, experiments so that we have a lot of that background knowledge already but if we get something weird like you know weird blood pattern all right let's see if we can figure out how that was made or uh maybe a bullet hole looks odd and it closed back up or something I'm like well let's try bouncing around off of this or whatever so we do some experiments along the way that's the fun sciencey part of this when you get something and you're like I'm not quite sure let me try to figure this out so we, we definitely do it's not 
every time I see a pattern, I'm going to go do a whole experiment to to reconstruct because a lot of that's already stored in my head from previous experience and training. But there's always something where you're like, oh, let me see if I can figure out how this was done, how this was created. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, I've been watching um, the new uh, rerun of Hawaii Five-0 um, that just ended. And um, they have something similar like the Angelotron. It's a big like computer on a table. And whenever they need something, they just do a little keystrokes and then do this swooshy motion. And then it appears on the screen, right? <laughs> so a lab result or f phone messages or emails all of a sudden pop up. So is that how it works for you, Roxanne, when you look at somebody's phone? Oh, you have this giant that. computer and you just type it in and then whoosh, it just pops <laughs> up? Well, I do have a giant computer, um, <laughs> but it doesn't do anything cool like that. It's just a weird computer. Um, it actually takes forever to get data off of phones, um, especially now when you can get phones with, so I have an iPhone, right? So you can get 64 gigabyte, the 128. With some of the Androids, you can get the micro SD cards with like, I've heard rumored up to potentially a terabyte. They know, or coming soon uh, to a store near you type thing. So with that sheer amount of data, my computer sometimes struggles. So it can sometimes take a couple of hours just to pull the data off the phone. Wow. And then after that happens, then I have to run it through the software program so I can actually see everything rather than ones and zeros because that doesn't mean anything to me at this point. And so then my software, if it's a giant phone, will take forever to just interpret all the data for me. And then I finally can look through everything and, and take a look. Um, but gosh, there's just so much information. So even with text messages, you know, depending on how much is saved on your phone, it can be tons of conversations. So how do I know which one to look at? How do I know, like, you know, what information the detective's interested in. So with my current position, I do take, depending on the case, sometimes detectives will just want the information and then they'll look through it themselves because they know what they're looking for and it's easier to do that than to explain. But some of them will tell me, hey, I want, I'm interested during this certain time frame. were they talking to this individual or were they taking pictures of, of, of this or that? Um, and so then they'll give me that information. And you know, sometimes we have tens of thousands of images that are saved on these phones that we have to scroll through. So your eyes kind of get a little tired. So <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. doesn't go that fast for me. <laughs> um, but I wish I had something cool that I could just like fly it up on the screen um, or even for the detective. So since my computer is really fast and fancy, I can open up things pretty quickly. And then if I generate a report for them, sometimes my PDF has been so big that it's crashed their computer before because they can't physically open it um, because I give them so much information. So I'm now we're trying to work on a way to, to help them with that so they could at least even see what they're getting. <laughs> I see that's where TV shows definitely have the better setup, right? Yeah. And I know this is not your area of expertise, but one thing that always cracks me up is facial recognition in yes. TV shows, right? They, the last one I saw, they saw a little face in a, um, in, a, in a, what do you call them? Christmas ornament, like a Christmas ball, right? It was reflected. And then they zoomed in and zoomed in, which that's the first thing I question. Like if, if the image is that big, how much can you really zoom in and how much can you get that resolution if you zoom that much in? And then of course they had the guy. It, I, that's not how it works, right? <laughs> um, I did, oh, sorry, not to, but I, I did a little bit of um, forensic uh, video enhancement years ago. And yeah, that is not how it works. It depends completely on the quality of the image. There's only so many pixels in there and you you can enhance it to a certain amount, but if the information's not there, it's not gonna match. There's no magic solution to make it appear to have this beautiful crystal clear picture. If, if it's little and fuzzy, that there's only so many pixels in there. <laughs> yeah, that's what I figured. And also that's another thing that I think goes really fast. So they throw, 
let's say they have a good picture of somebody, they're a suspect, and then they throw it in a database, right, which I figure there's probably a couple of databases, um, and then the computer has it within like 30 minutes. How realistic is that? <laughs> Um, so depends on, on the database, right? What you're searching. So we, we use several databases at our work. Um, but the one that I'm most familiar with is the DNA one. Um, you can get, if it's a, a local result, which means that something that's stored, um, within your local lab, you can get a result as soon as you hit enter, it'll really quickly shuffle through and tell you if there's any association. But if you're waiting for state level or national level, since they have so many um, profiles that are entered into their database, they only run their um, comparisons either once or twice a week. And so if you load it, you know, say they run it on a Tuesday and you load yours up on a Wednesday, you're gonna wait until the next Tuesday to get your result. Um, they normally don't do that unless you call them and say, oh my gosh, emergency, please make an exception for me, run it now which, you know, you don't want to do that too much and get on their <laughs> nerves, right? Because <laughs> yes. you got you to gotta wait, wait your turn. Um, <laughs> fine. So, so at least for that, it goes quick. And then I know Tony Ann works with a different database too. Yeah, for, <clears throat> for mine, what it is is the cartridge cases. And so we scan them and it, it only takes a few hours to get our results back. But what's different on our, and I, I don't quite know how, um, the databases Roxanne works with work, but for us, because it's such a visual science, it's all microscope, the computer, TV makes it seem like the computer's better. And so a lot of times we go to court and everyone wants to know, well, what did the computer say? The computer's not as good as the human eye. It, it, at some point it may be, but right now it's not. So even when we run our data or searches through the database, it doesn't pop up with, oh, here's the gun. It pops up with, here's a list of 653 of our top choices. And it's kind of like in a Google image search. And so you just sit there and you go, nope, nope, nope. Oh, that looks interesting. You look after a while, nope, nope. And you kind of go through. And if you find something, then you pull the evidence and actually put on the microscope and look. But that is, part of it is waiting for the database to go. But for us, the bulk of the time is actually physically sitting there and going through image by image and making a decision one at a time, is this it or isn't it? So I think uh, Leighton Prince, their fingerprint DNA, uh, fingerprint, their fingerprint database is very similar. They have to go through manually and search as well. So that is different for the visual comparative sciences. Okay, I don't know if you can share those stories, but in your professional experience, was there a case where you're like, where it was so easy to, um, catch the perpetrator because he, he or she did something stupid where you went like, oh, I can't believe he or she just did that. Can you, is there an example? And if so, are you allowed to share something like that? <laughs> I think I can. Do you have one, Roxanne? I've, I've got... Oh, you share yours first. <laughs> All right. Um, well, there is kind of a joke that we don't catch the smart ones. Uh, but <laughs> beyond that, years ago, I worked, this isn't so much forensics, but um, part of what I did was I would um, help with some of the financial crime cases. And so there was a guy who forged a check, something like, I don't really remember exactly, but on the check, he wrote his real name, put his driver's license number, put his thumbprint, and then they had him on camera and he actually I don't know what happened, but he was missing part of his nose. So they had him on camera, a uh, video surveillance at the bank. And when we went up to him, he's like, nope, not me. Like, I don't know how, more, like, who else looks just like you with missing half a nose with your same thumbprint, your same signature, your same name, your same driver's license number. How, but he, he was, at, nope, not me. <laughs> okay, sure. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. So, you didn't quite need a <laughs> <laughs> no, it was pretty, you, know, you get it and I'm like okay well there's no way it's really this guy but let me you know pull him up anyway and there's his picture and there's the guy and I'm like okay I guess it was him like, not really mastermind criminal but you know the <laughs> <laughs> easiest to solve case <laughs> that is a great example thanks for sharing that Roxanne do you have one too um I just think some of the easier ones are um 
like with a, a DNA, right? Um, some of the samples are a little easier when they're something that we would call single source instead of a mixture. So single source meaning that it comes from one person rather than more than one person. So some common ones are just your biological fluids, right? So blood, saliva, things like that. And it's always really easy when, say, a suspect is breaking into a car and they do something like to break open the window and they end up cutting themselves as they either reach in to unlock it or a piece of glass cuts them and you get all these nice drops of blood everywhere. And then you swab it and it's a great single source, one person profile. You ask the victim for their reference and that owns the vehicle and it's not theirs. And you're like, well, it's most likely the person that broke this window. And <laughs> Hopefully we either get a database hit or something along those lines. So those ones are usually pretty quick and, and easy. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing we sometimes get now is um, with all the cameras out there, sometimes we have full on video of what happened. And that's always fun too, especially for reconstruction. It's like, oh, here's, you know, this is what I think that happened. And here's the video to show exactly what happened. And like, yep, that's it. That's <laughs> yeah. Can't argue with that evidence. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. There's so many cameras out there, right? And in the British TV shows that always comes across, it's the CCTV, right? And they seem to have that everywhere and law enforcement seems to have full access to that. Is that something that's true in America as well? Um, I mean, we do, depending on where you're at, there are cameras, especially the, the new thing now with like the ring doorbells and stuff like that. I mean, if it's in a residential area, you can usually, you know, look across the street and, hey, does that neighbor have a ring doorbell? Can we ask them if we can look at their footage of what potentially happened or people with their home security systems um, are usually pretty generous. If you say, hey, a crime happened across the street, do you have any cameras pointing in that direction um, and businesses too? So you sometimes have good luck with that or the, those like cameras on the, the intersections to catch the speeders going through and stuff, you sometimes might get some info from that, but it's always so sad when you, you take a look at the video and it's just right on the edge of it. Oh. You know it's happening just off frame and it's close, but you didn't catch it. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing with cameras too is sometimes it's deceptive. So most of the time it's not. You see, you either see it or you don't, but there's sometimes, I've, I've seen some cases where the camera doesn't catch what's going off just off screen. So it's definitely can alter the viewer's perce perception of what happened. I've seen some examples like um, officer's body worn camera video, you know, and I saw one case, someone presented it in a conference that I went to and, you know, first it was the one camera and it looks awful because it looks like, you know, this officer just shot this guy for nothing. But then you see the camera perspective from someone else and you see that the guy's pulling a gun, but in the one, because of the way his body was angled and all that, it doesn't look like it. It just looks like, you know, he's standing there and sort of put his hands up and, oh my gosh, he got shot. But then the other one, you see, no, he was actually fumbling, but it was, it was from the wrong direction. It was slightly off. So we love video because it tells us stuff, but you always have to be aware of that. It, it's a very single source perspective Effective. And <clears throat> when an officer there or, or witnesses or even, you know, whatever's going on, there's sights, there's sounds that are outside of the view of that camera that it, it's definitely still giving you a limited perspective. So I, I found that very interesting in a, few, in a few of the cases I've come across where, yes, it tells you, but it still isn't a full picture. So you have to always take it with a grain of salt. That makes sense. See. With all the technology we have, right? We have the cameras, we have access to the phones, we have DNA analysis, which we didn't have, not in a too distant past. Do you think TV shows like um, How to Commit a Murder and Get Away With It um, have a point? Like, can you even still get away with something or are we so advanced that, no, we'll, we'll get you? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, obviously we have still have unsolved murders, so it means you still could get away with it. Um, just depends on what you leave behind at a crime scene and kind of like what Tony Ann had mentioned, you know, looking at a scene and trying to decide what's important. Maybe, you know, there was a pile of clothes somewhere and 
you didn't think it was important and didn't end up collecting it, but that was the suspect shirt and there was his, his or her DNA all over it and you didn't get anything anywhere else, like that, that was your moment. So, I mean, at crime scenes, they don't show it on TV, but they can sometimes come back with boxes and boxes and boxes of things because they don't want to leave anything behind that yeah. could be important. Um, so, I mean, again, like I said, we definitely have a lot of unsolved cases here, um, waiting on stuff. Maybe we have a DNA profile, but nobody to compare it to. So it's just sitting in the database, just waiting for um, the suspect's profile to get uploaded one day and then it will hit. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously people still successfully doing this. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Don't you add anything to add to that? Yeah, it's a constant, it's a constant battle back and forth. You know, people hear about what we do and they try to, they try to, you know, not leave DNA or not leave fingerprints. You know, people learn about fingerprints, they start wearing gloves, whatever. So there's, there's some knowledge that people have, but people don't have a real under, true understanding of what we do. So I think there's, a, there's usually something that they mess up, but then on the other end, it's, it's on us to collect it, to find it, to do it. Roxanne's right. You can have hundreds of pieces of evidence for a single case and still maybe not get what would have been your most important thing. There's a theory, Lockhart's theory of, um, oh my goodness, they're going to kill me for not remembering it. Lockhart's theory of exchange. What is it? Help me, Roxanne. I was going to say either exchange or transfer. Yeah, something like that. I should know this, but it's all right. right off my head. And, and the idea is that everywhere you go, you leave something behind and you take something with you. So that could be DNA, it could be fibers, it could be hairs, something. So in theory, there's always something to find, but whether or not we are going to find that single hair in a giant field that actually is going to make a difference, we don't, we're going to try, we're going to do the best we can, but we, for us too, we only get one shot at this. You know, that, that's the other thing. You go to a scene, it gets locked down, we show up, we do our processing. When we leave and we release the scene, that's it. We're done. And if we find out later on, oh, that red shirt that the suspect was wearing, that that was, we saw that it was hanging in the closet or it was in the laundry basket. But you know what? He had laundry everywhere because he hasn't done laundry in three months or whatever. And so I didn't take all his clothes. But now, oh, oops, it was there. I and I didn't collect it because I didn't know. So that's why it's important for us to have the communication with the detectives and get quick witness accounts and all that. But it's, we do the best we can, but it's never 100%. And so, yes, sometimes things can slip through the cracks, but we try. We really try as hard as we can. And most of the time we're successful, just not always. Yeah, well, who is successful all the time, right? <laughs> we try, we try. So um, we're doing this panel uh, partly because on May 22nd is Sherlock Holmes Day. Um, so it's celebrating sort of forensic science or anything criminal, I suppose, criminal justice. <laughs> Um, Sherlock Holmes has been always fascinating to me just because it seems like he's one person who does the job of what you're describing a whole team is doing. Do we have a detective in San Diego like that? And who is it? Who do I need to call if a crime is committed in my head? We definitely have great detectives, but none of them work in the lab, so we still need to do all the science for them. <laughs> How likely is it? Um, that you have a, a, a person that is so attuned to reading, because that's kind of his skills, right? He's got the, the psychological skills to read people when they say something or how they act, how they dress. I mean, he notices the minute little things. Um, and then of course he has, he has that, that vision that I described earlier. It comes into a crime scene, he looks around and he finds that tiny little hair that nobody else saw on the carpet line, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I find it fascinating. I think it's, yeah, I, I wish I was that smart, I guess. <laughs> do you ever feel like Sherlock Holmes when you do your work? Um, most of the time, no. <laughs> the, the crime scenes I've gone to, you know, you, you don't know a person's house, so, and you don't know the state that it's normally in, so you go in and you think to yourself, well, I, I don't know, did somebody bring this beer bottle in? Was it here originally? You know, which is the benefit of talking to people. But, um, and actually I 
don't interact at all with either victims or suspects or people. So I don't get to you know, see their body language or stuff like that. But all I get to do is see what they've either recorded on their phone or what they left behind and uh, just seeing that one little piece. But I am always impressed with the detectives that do have those, you know, great communication and interview skills that they can talk to somebody and just pick up on those little things. Um, we must have a lot of good training. We also have a really cool group in our lab, the polygraph unit, and they are very good at um, talking with people. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Tony Ann, how about you? Do you like Sherlock Holmes? I do. I absolutely do. Um, I think I, I'm always impressed. You know, he's really observational, which I think most of the lab sciencey people super good with the observations. But then, like you said, also the people skills and that's where, you know, you're always impressed by things that you're not necessarily good at yourself. So I, sometimes I'll watch the detectives interview people and I'm like, how did you, you know, they're just talking, talking, talking. That's like, oh yeah, I did it. Like, how, how did you get him to do that? That's not my skill. And I just don't have that kind of patience either. Cause you listen to them. They kind of go, oh, well, what about this? What about, I'm, my, I'd be like, did you do it? Yes or no? Okay. You remind me. I have no patience for you. I'm going to go look at my blood. You know, like, I, <laughs> I, I don't have that kind of those skills. So, but that's why, again, it's a team effort. I mean, we all wish we could be Sherlock Holmes and have all these amazing skills, but the reality is uh, it, it takes a bunch of people, you know, someone with really great interview skills and someone with really great, you know, um, who really has a good understanding of blood or a good understanding of guns or good understanding of DNA. And it's all this expertise that we combine together to make all of us into one big Sherlock Holmes. It's, it's nobody's as good as him all by himself. We all have to join forces and expertise. I like that though. I like the teamwork aspect of it. I think that's, that's yeah. a great, it's a great thing, right? I mean, even Sherlock Holmes has Dr. Watson. It's at least a team yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we talked about a lot, but is there anything that you wish I would have addressed or asked something that you are so excited about your job that you just love to do and you want people to know about? I just think forensic science is so much fun. It's one of the cool sciences that not only do you get to be nerdy at work, but it then also applies to the law in a bigger picture. So um, it's definitely different from some kind of research organizations or schools where you get to just go in and do all these crazy experiments and see what works. Um, our tests have to abide by the laws and they have to be able to be used in the court of law. Um, so it's definitely, it's an interesting science in that regard because we are, sometimes it feels like we're a little more confined um, because we're only allowed to do certain tests. Even though we might think, oh, if I could just change this setting a little bit, it would help, but I can't. So I'm stuck with what I have. Um, so it does, make you creative in the sense of you have to work with what you got and try your best. Um, and then hopefully if it's something that you really want to change, then you can go forward and make the change and try to get it approved in the court of law. So. How about you, Tony? I think for me, you know, it, it sounds so horrible and callous to say, this is fun and this is exciting because we're dealing with horrible things that happen to people. And I think it's kind of like being a doctor or a nurse or something where you have to put that buffer on and say, you know what, I know this is a horrible thing where this person was murdered, um, but I can't help that. All I can do is help the community, help the family, help stop this person from killing again or, or raping again or abusing a child again, whatever it is that the case that we're working on. So it's, it's very, sounds very awful to say that this is fun, <laughs> but aside from the horrors of it, the science itself is fun. It is interesting. And you get to do things that you wouldn't um, normally get to do otherwise. It, it's, it, it's, it's a problem solving logic kind of puzzle is sitting there and going, well, if this happened and this happened and trying to put things together, the experiments are fun, especially depending on where you're at. I mean, I talked about the blood spatter. Honestly, it put on a whole bunny suit and a hammer and smacking sponges filled with blood and go you know like art project that's fun I'm sorry there's nothing <laughs> like maybe it's a little gross maybe it's a little weird that is fun I also like I said work in firearms I get to shoot things in the name of science the, you know a few weeks ago we were out there and we we're like let's see what happens when we shoot this old cell phone and it like the battery was smoking and you know I 
it's fun. And I'm doing this. I'm getting paid to do this. I'm getting paid to go to the range and shoot machine guns at, you know, I don't even know what and go, oh, look at the, you know, the, the cool mark that it made when the bullet ricocheted off the hood of this car. It's fun. There, I mean, it's a fun job. I get to, you know, we always joke for like, yes, for science and the name of science, but you, you get to do a lot of cool things and a lot of problem solving, but you're also doing good for the community. You know, I always wanted, like I said, I've wanted to be in forensics since I was a kid, but I definitely knew I wanted to do something that helped people. I, I wanted to do something that I can feel like my life made a difference in somebody else's life. And so that's something that we get to do and that's something we get to take away with all this too. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. And one thing I don't know about your profession is kind of the, the balance between um, male and, and female in your job. I don't think that forensic science is necessarily something that a lot of, um, I would think a lot of women are in and a lot of girls would think about going into. Um, but clearly you are both women in the field. Um, why, why and if do you think it's important to have women in that field, in that job? What can women bring to forensic science that might be different from the male counterparts? Well, cool fact, I think we're primarily female in most of our units. Hey! Woohoo! Um, yeah, we have a, the majority of our amazing group that responds to the crime scenes and collects evidence are minus one person, all women that go out to every single homicide in San Diego, plus other major crimes. It, it is them, and they are amazing, um, and a lot of other units too. So we do have a really great balance, I think, and it's, um, it's a really positive part of the community that it doesn't feel like it's really overrun by one gender or the other, or if anything, it might be more female. <laughs> um, but it's a, I really do enjoy that. It's really fun being able to be in a group um, that you feel that you have that much of a mixture of people. That's great to hear. Tony, is the same for you? Uh, yeah, I think historically, maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was mostly men. And over time, forensics has become a much more female-dominated career. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it is, but I think something about that problem-solving just seems to attract women. I, I don't know why we try to hire <laughs> men and women, but it, it, even just the people applying the bulk of it is female. And people are surprised to hear that. Even in my unit, I, I work in firearms, which you wouldn't expect. And even as much as 10, 15 years ago, it was almost predominantly men. But for the past 10 years, everybody who's gotten hired, both in my department and outside, it's, it's, I'm watching it change. You know, I used to go to these conferences and I was one of a handful of women and now it's 50-50 at least and most of the newer hires are female. It's just, it's just changing and it's because forensics is something that seems to be attracting women more so than, than men. I, I don't know why I don't have an explanation, but it's, it That's is. great, though. I guess I got my perception from TV shows because not that they don't have females on the teams, but normally the ratio is different, right? They normally have more male on the team than they have females on the team. So that's uh, a thing where TV doesn't reflect reality, which is good to know. I'm, I'm really excited to hear that there's so many females in the field. I think that's great. Um, a lot of people are surprised, especially though it's always, even now, even in the police department, I'll definitely get some reactions when I'm walking around in my dress and heels with, you know, an AR going to test fire. And, you know, pe <laughs> people don't expect that when I go to court and they're like, oh, the gun expert's coming and they don't expect to see, they just don't expect to see a woman. It, it, it's, it's still, a, the perception is still changing. They don't, people don't expect that. But yeah, it's, it's mostly female now. That's wonderful. That's great. I got... Not all of my questions answered, but <laughs> a lot of my questions answered, and I really appreciate you being so patient with all my questions. Um, anything you want to add before we close it out today? No, just continue to do science. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> fun, science is fun. I used to not think that I, 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 I don't know that I initially thought I would be a scientist, I, even though it was forensic science. I didn't think, oh, I'm a scientist. And then as I got going in the crew, I'm like, no, I am. I am a real scientist. I get to use science to solve problems. And it, it's awesome. It's a very, 
it's a very cool field and it's different. A lot of science, I think a lot of kids are scared away from science because um, they only see one side of it. They only see, you know, they think sitting in a lab with a bunch of beakers and, and there's that part of it too. And it's a wonderful and amazing, but science for me is going out to the range and shooting guns. It's smacking, you know, a bloody sponge with a hammer. That's science too. And it's, I, I, when I talk to high schools, elementary schools, whatever, when I talk to kids, that's what I always tell them. Science, don't look at science in this little box of, oh yes, I'm in a lab coat and, you know, pouring from beaker to beaker and it's my whole day. No, science is a lot more than that. Not just forensics, there's other things you can do with science, but forensics is one very different and very interesting application of science that it, it's just, it's fun, I enjoy it. Yeah, it really sounds like it. And I think you're right. I mean, the, the puzzle solving part is also science, right? There's a lot that goes into science. There's, you know, there's so many fields that make up science and so many activities that um, are considered science and yeah I think that's a great great thing to end on with this talk I want to thank you both for being here today spending an hour with me to chatting about what you love to do thank you so much Roxanne thank you so much Tony Ann it was great thank you. <laughs> and then I hopefully will see all of you at one of the upcoming webinars the Fleet Science Center offers a lot of science um, on YouTube right now, we do a lot of virtual, so check us out, Fleet TV on the Fleet Science and YouTube channel. The Comic-Con Museum is putting out a lot of stuff to keep you occupied and have some fun during this uh, rather stressful time um, at times. Um, keep on doing science, keep on having fun, and stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. And we'll see you soon. Bye.